are in the book of Philippians today, chapter 1. So Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read today. And it'll be a chance for us to speak about it later together. So Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to begin the third verse. Third verse today. So it says, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory of and praise of God. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. So may God add a blessing to the reading of God's word today. And so this morning I wanted to begin by sharing with you a legend that comes from our Native American brothers and sisters that actually is part of what is the Cherokee Nation. There is a, a ritual, there is a, a rites of passage that takes place among many tribes where a young person who is on the cusp of going from childhood to adulthood that you might call a rites of passage, that that young person is taken out into the forest. And what would happen is usually it would be the father who would take the child into the forest, deep in the forest, and find a place where a tree had fallen, a place where one could sit with their back rested for a while. And the father would explain to their child that this is your moment to go from childhood to adulthood. This is the ritual that we practice. And this is what's going to happen. You are going to be blindfolded. And that blindfold must remain on you for the entire night. So while you're blindfolded, you also cannot yell out for help. You cannot scream. You can't say anything. And the third thing is you cannot get up. You cannot move from the place that I'm putting you is where you have to stay. And so this child, this Cherokee, was blindfolded by their father and placed by this tree, by this log, and left there for the night. You're going to imagine what it might be like for you or for me to be in a forest all night long, blindfolded, and told you couldn't take it off until the sunrise. You can imagine this child heard all kinds of noises while they were there. They heard the sound of howling. They heard the sound of movement. A big animal they felt was nearby. The sound of rustling in the leaves. They heard the sound of the wind blowing through the trees. And all night they sat there. And you could imagine that they were terrified. Now it can be that way in life sometimes. You know, there's times in life where we simply cannot see what is yet to come. 
There's times in life where we don't know what's going to happen, where we find ourselves in the unknown. Have you ever been there in your life? You didn't know what was going to take place next. You weren't sure about what was happening around you. Sometimes in life, we ourselves can get a sense of feeling isolated and fearful and terrified and anxious. It's something about facing the unknown that can trigger so many things inside of, of each of us. The unknown, the uncertain. You know, if you're like me, I like certainty, right? I like the assurance that I know what's going to happen next and what's going to take place. In fact, right now, one of the things that I want to caution us about as we now enter into the second month of 2020 is, again, oftentimes we can begin to feel overwhelmed with all that's happening around us, and especially in our own nation. In fact, there was a study recently released by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and they have researched that during election times, during long election cycles, people's health, our health, our mental, emotional, and physical health actually deteriorates during long elections. And my God, aren't we already into a long election? In fact, what often happens again is fear and anxiety rises amongst us. This is why I, I want to invite you to please make sure during 2020, first of all, make sure you vote. Amen? Make sure you vote. Make sure you stay engaged. Make sure you are educated and aware of what's happening. But at the same time, also, please, please take care of yourself. When you have to unplug from all the madness in the media, unplug. Turn on Looney Tunes. <laughs> it's the same thing happening <laughs> in D.C., right? But at least it's Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. But find ways, again, seriously, find ways to take care of yourself uh, during this time. Because again, what often happens, as you see it happening, is that what gets pumped into the political process is so much fear. Fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety of what's going to happen, of what's going to be, of what's going to take place. And, and unfortunately, again, we have leaders that love to pump more and more fear into the system that our anxiety continues to rise because of the uncertainty of what is going to be. And we're just not sure of these things. And again, it raises our own sense of anxiety and fear. And so I, I, I hope and pray that you, again, you and I find uh, this time and, and turn away from the politics of fear that wants to put us against one another the fear of the other, and let us speak a word of hope of what we all can do together. Amen? But it's going to be fear and anxiety. So that's why what I'm inviting us to do together is during the month of February, we're going to be going through the book of Philippians. We start today. In fact, if you look on the back of the sheet you received when you came in today, you'll see the daily readings all focus on the book of Philippians. And so I invite you to, to take your time uh, to go through this, uh, this letter that Paul writes, because it's powerful and it speaks to us today. It's very convenient, too, because there's four Sundays in February and there are four chapters in the book of Philippians. And really, Paul, in this writing, uh, is addressing again this, this fear, uh, this danger and the risk that we have, anxiety that happens when he writes his letter. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit why. Because Paul writes in Philippians, the words I especially want to share with you today, is he says that for all of you sharing God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So Paul is writing this letter. This is one of the letters he writes while he is in prison. Paul, St. Paul, the one who had been Saul, and God calls on the road to Damascus to go and preach, and then becomes Paul. Paul is in jail with no 
Bail. Come on, y'all know that. You, you all know that? Little limerick. In jail with what? No bail, right? That's Paul. Paul is in jail with no bail. Paul is in prison. Paul is locked up, which, by the way, the reason Paul is in prison is very much like the reason Dr. King was in prison when he penned a letter from the Birmingham jail. In fact, Dr. King in that letter actually cites Paul. Dr. King says from that letter in that Birmingham jail, he says that more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world. So I'm compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. I am like Paul. I must constantly respond to the call for aid that people have. And so Paul, again, is locked up by the Roman rulers, by the Roman emperor, because in Rome, Rome understood that Caesar was God, that the emperor was God, and you were to worship the power of the Roman government. The state was more important than God. And Paul shows up and says, wait a minute. The emperor's not God because God is what? God. And Paul says, in fact, let me tell you about how God has revealed God's true self through the one named Jesus. And through Jesus, God has spoken a message that all are God's children. Paul says there's no longer male or female, slave or free, Jew or Greek, but all are one in Christ. And so Paul shows up on the scene to challenge the emperor, the ruler, to say, you are not God. You are human like what? Everybody else. Well, you know, those in power don't like the gospel when it's preached. And so they threw Paul in prison. And that's, again, a word of, of caution for us today that is happening all around us, that we have to see what's happening so much to our own faith, what's happening to the Christian church, is we have watching a marriage take place between the state and our faith, where we're seeing how somehow the two are being intertwined in ways that are very complicated, because there are many times when our faith will stand against what the power of the state is trying to do. Are y'all with me? In other words, the church is called to be the conscience of the state and not the cheerleader of the state, but to stand and speak a word from God that again calls for justice and calls for the right treatment, especially for those who are most vulnerable and those who are so easily attacked. That's the gospel of Jesus that Paul was preaching. And it's important for us to keep that same mentality mindset today, especially we're watching what has been, I've talked about many times before we continuously is the rise of nationalism today not just in our own country, but throughout the world, and especially in, in Europe right now. There's a great article written about this theologian you may not have heard of before, but when I was in seminary, we, were, we read many of his works. He's a German theologian named Johann Moltmann, and Moltmann grew up in Germany during the time of World War II. And so recently he was speaking at a conference, and he warned everybody at that conference. He warned them in these words that he said that humanity precedes or humanity is more important than nationality. That when it comes to the eyes of Christ, all, again, are children of God, not dependent on the nation in which you reside. Oh, you all are quiet today. Do me a favor, touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, are you alive? Did anyone not respond? We will call 911. No, but seriously, I want, you to, I want you to hear these words. I want you to hear what this great theologian is saying to us who grew up during the rise of Nazi Germany, who grew up in his own family, as he speaks about, his own father, who did not like Hitler, 
who disagreed with Hitler, but felt that he had to put his country first at that time and do what he knew was wrong because somehow he felt it was right for the country. But later his father regretted what he did serving in the Nazi army. And Moltmann himself, again, was drafted at the age of 16 as the war was on his decline. And he spoke about how, even for himself, he watched how extreme nationalism of Nazi Germany came to kill and cause so much death and destruction throughout. And he later, as he became a Christian and follower of Jesus Christ, again began to see how humanity is more important than nationality. The Church of Christ, he says, is present in all the people on earth and cannot become a national religion. The Church of Christ embraces the whole inhabited earth. She's not a tribal religion, he says. He's not, it's not a Western religion. It's not a white religion. But the church is for all humanity to be welcome to be a part of. The church's Christ is not national. It's a church for all nations and all of humanity. That's what Paul was saying. That's what Paul was preaching when Paul got put in prison. Paul was in prison because this message, which again, those in power don't like to hear because the gospel flips the tables. And the gospel says that those who are in God's eyes the most are not those at the top with all the resources and all the power and strength, but God's eyes are with those who are most vulnerable and left out of society. That's what Paul, it flips. In fact, even think about this. Paul is the messenger of God, and where is he at? He's in prison. God is with, think about God is with those in the prison and not those filling the prison. Do you see that? That's the message that Paul is bringing that has him placed in this part. And Paul is like the child in the story I shared, the, the Cherokee nation, the child who's left alone and who's in this forest and he doesn't know what's going to happen. Paul is in prison. Paul is locked up all by himself and Paul is looking for what do I do? How do I get through this moment? And see, whenever you're going through something in life, this is so important, when you're going through a difficult time in life, when you're feeling terrified, overwhelmed, there's always this choice we can make. We can choose to either turn to God or turn from God. Are we going to turn to God in those hours of our life? Are we going to call upon faith to bring us through? Are we going to choose futility and fate? And I don't know about you today, but I'm standing here today because I know in the most difficult times of my life, I called upon God and I found that God was right there. Paul says, I'm going to turn to God and call upon my faith. But here's another important part of what Paul does here as well. Uh, Paul begins to say, in turning to God, he also turns towards God's people, which is what the church is for. You know, I love Psalm 121. I lifted my eyes, what? To the hills. From what? For where will my help come? And so Paul is turning to God. But watch this. The way he turns to God is by turning to God's people. Paul turns to the church. Paul turns to the people who he knew could get him through this hard time. And so he's writing these letters. In fact, we got a letter. I wanted to share it with you today. This came this week from Nancy Jacoby. Everybody remember Nancy, her and her son, Carrie, Belonged to one of the former churches that made Journey Faith. They often would sit over here. They live in Florida, and they used to come up to Maryland in the summer times. And uh, Nancy Jacoby's her health has declined greatly, and so she said they're not coming up north anymore. They're going to stay in Florida year round. Well, she just wrote this letter to us, and, and I just want to read it to you, just real quick. It says, "Dear friends, one and all at Journey of Faith, Happy New Year, and." Be and belated but warm wishes for Christmas. The wishes for Christmas Day are late, 
But wishes for Christmas are never late because we are to try to live Christmas every day. I've sent you a gift to the ELCA, Good Gifts Ministries, in your names. I want to help many children and families who struggle to live despite extreme poverty. I do wish for all of you there at Journey of Faith God, Church, God's blessings of healing, strength, peace, grace throughout the new year. May love and prayers in Jesus' name bless you always. Signed, Nancy Jacoby. And I love what you put, and Carrie too. <laughs> but you know how, when's the last time you wrote a letter? Right? When's the last time you wrote a card? Do you know how much that matters and means when you write somebody? I know we text, and that's fine. But my goodness, to write a letter. And Nancy wrote this letter to us from Florida for us to read and us to take in and cherish. Well, guess what? Philippians is Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Just imagine when they gathered worship that first time, they opened the letter and they read it. They read it for all to hear because Paul had the, was the one that helped start that church in Philippi. And while he's in prison, though, it is he's interesting to note that Paul wrote, and this is the good part, Paul wrote his letters from prison to the churches that were the most healthy in their life. Last Sunday, we read uh, from Corinthians. Did you all know, and you probably, you, probably met, you probably met some Corinthians in your life too, right? Did you know Corinthians are a hot mess? Did you know that? The Corinthian church was a hot mess. That's why Paul wrote that letter about how you all got to see each other as the body of Christ. You got to love each other because they didn't know how to be church together. So that was a different letter when Paul wasn't in prison. Paul was just writing, but while in prison, Paul is reaching out to church in Philippi, saying that I need you right now. And he writes these beautiful words to them, saying about how, you know, you, you, I, lift up, uh, I, I lift you up in prayer all the time. I think of you always, because, again, think of them as what helped him get through. I thank God every time I remember you, he says, some people, you know, because some people you just want to forget, Right? And he said, I think about you all the time. I remember you all the time in my prayers and how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ. And he, he says, and this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and, and full insight. And so Paul in this moment, here's what's important. Paul in this moment of need, this moment of loneliness, the moment of isolation, he's trying to connect the people that are going to help him out. In his moment of need, Paul is trying to reach out to people who are going to help him out. Because not everybody is going to what? Y'all with me? I'm going to say it again slower. <laughs> Paul is reaching out to church in Philippi because he's finding people who are going to help him out. Because not everybody is going to what? Oh, there you are. <laughs> I mean, that's important, isn't it? There are some people in your life, in my life, who don't help you. They actually what? Hurt you. And this is not to say you're better than somebody else. It's not to think of us as superior. But there are just some people who are what you might call toxic. They you know, hurt people what? Hurt people. And, and their hurt is boiling over. Their hurt is overflowing. And there's times in life like Paul, Paul is not in a position to be able to help them. But Paul what? Needs help. And so, again, one thing in life to learn is you don't have to disrespect somebody, but you do have to disconnect from somebody at times. And they may talk about you. They may dislike you. They may call you uh, every name but what? Behind your back. But guess what? 
They'll be all right. They'll be fine. Just take, when you take care of you, Paul is saying, I got to find someone, reach out to those who can help me. And, you know, yesterday I drove up to uh, Aberdeen, uh, up into Aberdeen training base. Uh, for those that know, again, Kai, Demetra, and Barbara's son is right now at a place called Free State, Maryland. I think I have a picture. There he is right there. So that's Kai. Kai is... I, I, I made him smile. I said, man, you better smile for your mom when I see the picture. <laughs> and again, I was, I was asked by the family and by Kai to be his mentor. And yes, it's mentor training day. And so myself and Jimmy and Tony, I'm sure it's Kai's mentors. There's this program called Free State. And basically it's run by the National Guard. And it's a program that helps young folks, youth who are on a path to drop out of high school, basically on a path that they won't graduate. And uh, again, God bless Kai. He's a good kid, but he was just on the wrong path. And he was and headed towards graduation. So his moms, God bless them, decided we got to do something, right? Because sometimes you got to do more than what you're doing now. And so they enrolled him in this program and prayed for him because he, he has till Friday to make some requirements. And he's trying. I believe he's trying. So, but just pray for him to get there by this coming Friday. And it was very sad because each child is allowed to have two mentors. And Kai has two mentors. But you'd be surprised how many kids had no mentors. No mentors. So if you ever want to look into being a mentor, look in this free state program. It's a great program I hope to stay connected to, even if the Kai finishes it. But yesterday we were there, and they brought nine cadets before us. So Assembly of Mentors, they brought nine cadets before us, uh, two girls and, and seven young men. Uh, and they were, we were allowed to ask them different questions uh, that, about how it was so far. They've been for three weeks. What would they learn so far? And this one young man really impressed me in an incredible way because he w- they were asked, you know, what have you learned about yourself was the question they were all asked. What have you learned about yourself? And without hesitation, this one young man stepped forward and he stood up tall and he said, what I have learned is that I am a leader and I have gifts to share. And he said, that is what my sergeants have taught me because my family and my friends only brought the worst out of me, but this place is bringing the best. And isn't that what happens in life? There are just those who bring the worst out of us. There are those that just attack and dig in and hurt. And again, you've got to be able to disconnect to take care of yourself. Because there are times where I can't help you right now because I have to what? Help myself. And that's what Paul is saying from prison. Paul is crying out from prison that while I'm in here, though, the the beloved, the amazing thing is that what's happened to me has actually begun to help the spread of the gospel. It's actually helped by Paul reaching out to share about what God has done and what the power of the gospel has for each and every one of us. That's the amazing thing that takes place in this moment, that actually in the suffering, and here's what's so important, in the suffering and hardship of life that comes our way are opportunities for God to do a great thing, a moment for God to show forth and bring us through what could be the most difficult and challenging times in our life. Last Sunday, we were gathering here, and as we left, I got a phone call. For my mother, my mom said, did you hear about what happened to Kobe Bryant? And I hadn't heard. And she said, Kobe Bryant died. And I said, Kobe Bryant? He died. Now, I'm not a Lakers fan, but I respect Kobe Bryant and all that he did in the game, but then after the game, as he so loved his daughter and was coaching his own team there. And she told me what happened. You all heard what happened, right? And it's heartbreaking. Nine people, nine people died on the helicopter. Three girls, three teenage girls. One, both parents. Another, another parent. And then Kobe and his 13-year-old daughter. The tragedy, the pain and suffering that all that moment had in it on that hillside in California. But did you begin to see what's happened since? Have you seen the amount of love and grief and support that's poured out? Have you seen the Staples Center 
where Kobe played, how at the Staples Center you had so many people gathered. And what was amazing for me to see the thousands and thousands of people who gathered, it was amazing to see that it was so many different people that gathered. You could see people of all colors and all creeds and all classes, economic and all religions and all sexualities and all beliefs. And guess what they did? They all came together because of what? Their pain and their grief. And they came together to share that pain and grief and that suffering in their moment together. Well, guess what the gospel does? Guess what the message of Jesus Christ does? It tells us that God has entered into the pain of life, that through the cross of Jesus, God enters into our suffering, into our isolation, into our terror, into our fears. God enters our pain. God even enters into our death through the cross. And God says, I'm going to meet you there, and I'll take you to where I am through the resurrection of life. That's the gospel. That's the message for us to hold on to and share with all to know that God meets us in the worst times of life. Because I want to go back to the story I started with today, the story about what happens in the Cherokee Nation, this rites of passage. I told you this young person was left all night in the woods, all night blindfolded, all night unable to see, unable to know what was around them. But they made it through the night. They made it through the isolation. They made it through their fear. And the sun rays began to beat down. They could see it through the blindfold. And so they lifted their blindfold. And as they looked, guess who they saw sitting right in front of them? His father had been there the whole time. So guess what? In life, when you think that you're all alone, that you're isolated, that you can't see how you're going to get through, and you think God has left you, God hasn't left. God is right there with you through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message. That's God's love that God meets us the worst places of life to be with us and bring us through. God is my help. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. And we want to take a moment to acknowledge any first-time visitors. I know we have a young lady here for the first time today, so we're glad you're with us today.